All right, everyone, we're going to get started. If you could please take your seats, we'll get started. So it's so great to see so many people, so many familiar faces. We've got a really fun and packed agenda, as you can see here. We've got many people from the team. You're going to hear panelists from across the investment community. And then we've got some portfolio companies. Um, so you actually get a peek of what companies are building from the earliest stages. Um, if I ask Sophie from Google to join me up here, a hand for Sophie. Hello. Hello. <laughs> Hello. Good to see you. Good to see you too. <laughs> so we'll jump in and just do a brief intro on both sides. So my name is Jed Rose. I'm a partner at Antler. My name's Sophie. I lead the UK VC ecosystem here at Google. Great. So we'll give you just a little bit of background kind of on our two sides and then we'll jump right in. Um, first off, for those of you who don't know, Antler is the world's most active early stage investor. What does that mean? It means we're active in a lot of locations, over 25 locations around the world. That portfolio number changes by the week. We're probably at over 1,000 portfolio companies now. We've had 6,000 plus founders, over 800 million external capital raised by portfolio companies, and we're present all over the world with 250 plus employees. Um, this is kind of the global view. Here in the UK, we're one location out of many within Europe. I guess just kind of three things to highlight for you. So we really specialize in pre-seed and seed investments. Pre-seed means what we call day zero. It's basically before a company's even formed. And so we focus on supporting founders, who might have ideas, but, but it's before they have a business. And we're backing teams with an industry agnostic approach. We have the ability to follow on all the way through Seed, Series A, and beyond. And then we've got this terrific global community and global team that allows us to support our portfolio. We have venture partners, advisors, we can help out with talent networks, and investor introductions. Another view on this stage-wise, some of these names might be familiar for those you know, who have seen investing in the UK. Day zero is kind of our space. Again, it's before teams are even formed. And then we've got early stage venture and so on. And so we're helping out across the different stages as they grow from there. In the UK, our portfolio is about 90 companies right now. Um, and we have several who've gotten to Series A stage now too. So hopefully that kind of gives the context of the types of investments that we're looking at and the portfolio companies that you'll be seeing shortly. Um, wanted to share this as this kind of an admin thing. If you happen to have to leave partway through, this QR code will take you to the portfolio companies you're seeing later today. I've been told that this slide will pop up a few times. I see a lot of pictures. Good. Um, so we'll bring this up again as we go through. And I think, Sophie, over to you. So, um, look, thanks again for coming. And it's, I said, an honor to be partnering with you on this event. Um, I just wanted to spend a couple of minutes talking a little bit about what Google's doing with the startup community. But firstly, I just wanted to go through a little bit of housekeeping. So as you're probably aware from the situation downstairs, Google takes security very seriously, <laughs> which means that you can't move freely around the office space. So if you do need to get back downstairs or uh, you want to go to the bathrooms, which is through the corridor, just let the security guard know and they'll help you kind of get back into the room or back downstairs or whatever you need to do. Um, we also are recording and phot photographing today's event. So if you don't want to be included in that, then just let Zena, who's just at the back of the room there, who's giving us a wave, uh, know and we'll make sure that we, um, we, we cater for that. So um, I just wanted to spend a couple of minutes talking about what Google's doing with the startup community. And a couple of months ago, I was speaking with a group of investors and I asked the question, why do you think cloud is so important to startups or technology startups specifically? And it struck me that none of them cited that it significantly reduces the barriers to entry for technology companies. So if you think about it, um, before cloud, technology founders would have to make big upfront investments in hardware, software, and server technology. And this would put a lot of people off starting their own business because they just don't have the capital to do that. And Ever since we've seen cloud come on the scene about 15 years ago, we've seen this massive balloon in, in technology companies. So with cloud, uh, companies, startups, individuals can get instant access to computing resources and advanced technologies with a couple of clicks and without having to make these big upfront investments. So um, for example, if a company wants to build an app, they just log into the cloud portal, they provision the services they need, they put their code on the top and then within a couple of minutes, um, your service is up and running. So it really has brought those barriers to entry down. And at Google, um, you know, we have a strong ethos of supporting the startup community. And that ranges from our venture arms, so Google Ventures, Capital G, and Gradient Ventures, all the way down to our more hands-on support, so our startup schools and our accelerators. 
Some of you may have heard of the Black Founders Fund. Um, we've just closed our third round of the Black Founders Fund, and with this, we've given four million in equity-free investment to 40 exceptional black-led businesses. In addition to that, they get access to kind of mentoring, workshops, various product discounts, incentives, and we've seen a massive amount of success around across these three funds. So we've seen over, I think, around 205 million in follow-on funding going into those startups since being on the fund. We've seen a 20% increase in hiring across all of the ones that have gone through the fund. And we've also seen them achieve a six and a half million um, or six and a half million in monthly recurring revenue. So I said, we're really proud of what we've achieved with this. And we've now extended it across to a couple of other areas too. So we recently launched a female founders fund. We also have a Latino founders fund. And we recently launched as well a Ukrainian founders fund, which aims to give equity free investment to Ukrainian founders who are building businesses that will contribute to rebuilding the Ukrainian economy once the war is over. So we also have our accelerator programs, kind of similar type of thing to the fund, but without the equity investment. Um, they tend to be 10 weeks long. Uh, they include access to workshops, mentoring, leadership training, and um, networking events. And they also, again, offer discounts and, and product incentives. Um, we tend to run these across lots of different areas. So, you know, just to name a few, climate tech, AI, security, but we also will do things like um, uh, location-based ones as well. So just a couple of examples are Latino founders and Brazilian founders. Again, we've seen some real great success here and they tend to be aimed at those early stage startups. So we're looking at kind of pre-seed, seed stage. Um, and just to give an example of the success we've seen on, on one particular one is our female founders accelerator. Said we've seen 36 women or th 36 female founded companies go through this um, across three years. And we've seen over 75 million in follow on funding going to those um, female founded companies. So these programs that we run really do make a big impact on getting the startups to the next growth stage. So I said I'd encourage any of you here to have a look at what we've got going on on our website because I said they, they really do make a difference. Can we go to the next slide? <laughs> Thank you. Um, so our, our biggest package of support uh, here at Google is our Google Cloud for Startups program. Um, and this is, a, again, a holistic package of support and it's aimed at early stage startups, so pre-seed seed, and it offers up to $200,000 in Google Cloud credits, ads credits, maps credits, workspace licenses, and access to a startup success manager who is there to kind of help link the startup with whoever they need within Google to help them on their journey. So the main um, acceptance criteria for this is that they've received pre-seed or seed stage funding. We do also accept Series A, but again, it has to be received in the last 12 months, mainly because, again, this is really a package of support for those early stage founders. Um, and the startup has to be founded in the last 10 years. We also have two other versions of this program. Uh, one is the AI version. Same package of support as the original program. The main difference here is just that uh, we increase the credit amount from 100K in the first year to 250K. So uh, overall package of $350,000 in cloud credits. And then we also have a Web3 version two. Main difference there is so, said same as the original package of support, but the main difference is just um, getting access to our product roadmap and being able to have input into that for Web3 th specific top topics, um, and you also get access to Web3 specific events. So if you are interested in learning any more about that, I said I'll be here all day, so feel free to come and ask any questions, um, but you can also scan the QR code here to learn more too. So that's pretty much everything I had to cover. Great. No, um, please join me in thanking Sophie and Google for hosting us. Thank you, Sophie. Yeah. Great. So I think we're over now to Edward Knight, who's president of Antler, who's going to give you his thoughts on the future. A hand for Ed, please. Uh, thanks, Jed and Sophie. Hi, everybody. Good to see you. I'm Ed. Uh, I'm part of the team at Antler. And I've been asked to sort of share a few thoughts on this incredible opportunity set that we're all part of, that we're all living, that day to day we're told is going through a downturn or a setback, but actually the long-term trends are so, so persistent here for some pretty obvious reasons, really, which I hope you'll all be able to agree on because they're based on truth and things that we can all see with our own eyes. Mainly two or three simple drivers, actually. One is that for the millennial generation, so anybody aged between 25 and 40, 
uh, which, by the way, constitutes 25% of global population at the moment. Uh, so it's probably worth paying attention to what that generation is doing because they're going to be running companies and countries within 10 short years. And for the first time in history, we know that people in that age group are less well off than their parents were at the same age of their stage of their lives, graduating in record numbers with record levels of student debt into real estate markets in any major city around the world, which are roughly five times the price of they were when I was 25 years old. Surprise, surprise, that's leading to some pretty different lifestyle choices and career choices. Lifestyle, if you think about it, we can see this. I don't have the charts here, but fewer people are getting married, fewer people are having children. So it assumes some type of national significance for governments because we know that governments who are charged with economic growth and stability, aging populations are the death of growth. It's a separate subject, but important nonetheless. In career choices, again, it's the same thing. It was the case 25 years ago that the world's most ambitious girls and guys tended to gravitate towards finance and law, possibly because that was where the wealth creation opportunity was perceived, no longer the case. Now, there's not a lot of data to support this, but on the data that we do have that's available, we can see that up to 30% of US university graduates now say that their number one career choice is to go into innovation. So all quite simply explained by economic circumstance and a number of other factors such as climate change, and other issues which people feel particularly strongly about. But these trends are pretty persistent and pretty easy to explain when you look at the levels of debt and house prices and all these other factors which are quite an important thing when young people are starting getting, getting started out in life. Now this is of course all happening at the same time, and Sophie, you did such a great job of summarizing this, at the same time that we're having a vertical explosion in the advance of technologies anywhere around the world. And this is primarily because of the cloud. The cloud's been around 10, 15 years or so. And it pretty much brought down the cost of building a business anywhere in the world by 90% overnight. Uh, we now have six or seven pivotal technologies that we can speak of today that are being built on the cloud. AI, machine learning, genomics, robotics, quantum blockchain, synthetic biology which are fundamentally uprooting the way that we feed ourselves, transport ourselves, power ourselves, finance ourselves, educate ourselves, care for ourselves, govern ourselves. Every aspect of any modern dynamic economy is being changed by these technologies. There's no escape. So you've got this mass migration of human capital turbocharged by this incredible progress that we're seeing in technology. And that is leading to an absolute explosion in innovation. 5% interest rates aren't going to change that because these technologies are bringing down the cost of all these businesses like gravity. You can't resist it. We've seen it happen time and time again. In some sense, all you needed to know over the last 50 years was Moore's Law. Same thing's happening now with battery technology and some of these other technologies where the costs are inexorably just coming down. We look at S-curves of adoption. We've all seen that chart, haven't we? We look at time to first 50 million customers. It took the airline industry 50 years to reach a million customers. Was that right? It's, anyway, that's, you get the gist of it. It took Pokemon Go nine days. I don't even know how long it took ChatGPT, which, by the way, a year ago, none of us had even heard of, just to give some sense to that. These S-curves of adoption are getting vertical. And it's not just happening in London or in any other big city around the world. This is a global phenomenon. These technologies are global. They're agnostic about language and border. You can build these businesses anywhere because of the cloud, as Sophie was describing. The number of cities that has hosted a unicorn in the last five years has quadrupled, reflecting the global nature of talent and the global nature of these technologies. So simplistically put, you've got this migration of human capital, this incredible explosion in technological growth. If we think just in the last 25 years, we've gone from 36 million to 5 billion internet users. 15 years ago, there was no WhatsApp, there was no Netflix, there was no uh, Uber, there was no Delivery Hero. So it's pretty logical to expect a pretty massive level of change just in the next five years, particularly with the arrival of AI and so on and so forth. So that should give a pretty good setup, really, for the activity that we're all in involved and engaged in here. Uh, demographic, technological. Now, of course, there is a third aspect to this as well, which is the elephant in the room, which is what I call existential climate. So I don't really know very much about this, so I defer to the scientists, look at the simple numbers, but we've emitted 1.8 trillion tons of carbon into the atmosphere. Half of that's come since 1990. That's an amazing thought, isn't it? So it's a bit like a data chart. It's just gone horizontal and then vertical. Scientists tell us that we can spend another 400 billion tons of carbon before we hit the one and a half degree threshold at which things start getting scary. 
Uh, and given that we're spewing out another 40 billion tons a year at the moment, that means we're probably going to hit that target in the next eight or nine years. So if we're to have any hope at all of getting anywhere near these targets, which of course the governments are so attached to for electoral reasons and other, just think about the sheer quantum of change that has to happen to every single part of our life to get anywhere near those targets, which we're supposed to be hitting by 2030. So demographic, technological, existential, it's a pretty compelling story, and it's starting to get picked up by some pretty serious people. Ray Dalio, who some of you may have heard of, founder of Bridgewater Associates in the United States, talks about innovation. Mark Andreessen, did anyone, who saw the Tech Optimist Manifesto in the last couple of weeks? Did anyone see that? He wrote this tremendous note in the United States, and he said there only are three sources of growth. Population growth, well, we already talked about that a little bit earlier. Better resource utilization and technology. So the evidence is pretty overwhelming for all those reasons. Maybe you agree with them, maybe you don't, but we've tried to sort of base them on fact and things that we can see with our own two eyes. And it's getting noticed by some pretty serious people. So I suspect that probably what happens in the coming years, although you may feel at the moment as if when you're building, it's so difficult to sell your story, it's so difficult to raise capital because funding environment's difficult and so on and so forth. Actually, if you were to take a step back and see where are we likely to be going on the next 5, 10, 15 years, it's so obvious. It can't be any other way. 5% interest rates aren't going to change any of this stuff. And so when you're selling your vision or getting your story across and trying to persuade people of the value and exciting nature of investing with you, some type of a time horizon is definitely appropriate. I mentioned just lastly, of course, that also I met the founder of Waze last week in Canada, super interesting guy, and he was saying that um, if you look at the value created in Netflix, Google, Apple, Microsoft, and so on, um, only 4% of the value of these companies was created in the first 10 years. It takes time. It takes a huge amount of persistence and focus and toughness and grit and spike and all these other things that we talk about. So I'll stop there. I hope that's a pretty compelling reason why we're in this extraordinary period. None of this should really be that surprising, by the way. You know, we move quite predictably in 50-year cycles. In some sense, the last 50 years has been about interest rates going from 15 to 1. Nixon took us off the gold standard in 1972. There was an inflation spike, interest rates from 15 to 1. Financial services industry of the Western world, the Goldman Sachs, Morgan Stanley that you've all heard of, those businesses were built around that narrative of falling interest rates. Of course they were. They were trading fixed income. 50 years before that, in some sense, was about industrialization. 50 years before that, military. 50 years before that, literacy. So you have these reasonably repeatable, visible 50-year cycles, Schumpeter, creative destruction, Kondratiev, long wave economic cycles. We've all heard of this. Seems like we're at the beginning of a new one. Now, who knows what's going to be the driver? Who knows? We just don't know. But there's a chance that it could be affected and driven by some of these things that we're talking about. I'll leave it there. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, Ed. Um, so that's a good macro view on the world. Um, I saw a version of that at our Global Partner Conference about a month ago in Amsterdam, and I thought it was really compelling, and hopefully gives you kind of like the worldview about why it's an exciting time to be building a company and solving people's problems. We've already talked about how Antler's approach is global. Um, what I'm about to share with you, I hope you guys take away a few interesting insights from this. Uh, basically, we've completed one of the broadest studies of European tech founders to date. And then, of course, Antler, as I explained earlier, we've experienced by investing in over 300 startups across 10 European geographies. So what I'm going to try to do over the next 10 or 15 minutes or so is to really kind of overlap the two so that you're getting some kind of clear insights in terms of what are we seeing with founders? What are we seeing with the industries that they're building? What are we seeing in terms of trends with pre-seed companies and what they're going after? So the structure of this is I'll walk you through kind of the founder backgrounds, applying these insights. We'll then walk through industries attraction and then a peek into trends for the future. And again, this is from the perspective of what we're seeing at the pre-seed stage. For founder backgrounds, we looked at unicorns and kind of the backgrounds and profiles of these founders. And then to the right, you see what Antler sees, which is aspiring founders, founders who join a program, and those who become portfolio companies. For unicorns in Europe, there's 845 founders of 387 tech unicorns. This number was a lot lower 12 years ago. I think when I first moved to the UK 12 years ago, it was about eight unicorns in the UK, and now it's over 140. So this number has just exploded. And that's exciting for many reasons. You've got many, many more people with deep expertise and experience in high growth environments, VC-backed companies. Ironically, this comes out to about 2.2 founders per team, which is interesting because that's about the number that we see at Antler as well for the teams that come through the cohorts. In Europe, we've had over 72,000 founders, 72, founders that have applied to Antler residencies across Europe. 
So these are people who join Antler without a business, without a team, and then over a 10-week period with our cohort program and our residency, they learn the skills, they learn the tools, they meet other founders, they meet portfolio companies to build conviction on the team, to build conviction on the problem that they're solving, and then make real progress in ideation and execution to build something that has you know, transitional impact and that has proof that they're VC backable. The founders is about 2,600. So the math on this is about a 3% conversion rate from applications to founders. So we're genuinely looking for the best, the brightest, the most driven. On average, it's about seven and a half years of experience. 60% have been founders before. So it's an interesting profile and also split across domain experts, commercial experience, and engineers. And then last, we have the portfolio companies. And so there's 270 portfolio companies that Antler has. Um, that roughly translates to about 1% of the original number of founder applicants that we got. So that's kind of the journey. Those are the numbers. We'll walk through this a bit more level of detail in terms of the insights of what we've seen in the UK unicorns and what we're seeing here in the UK with the founders that we work with. So first off, probably not a surprise, London is the unicorn capital of the region with 198 founders. That's 23% of the unicorn founders. 43% are from overseas. We see this in Antler as well. We have over 60 nationalities in the UK portfolio. Um, I believe we get a, is it over 100 nationalities globally across the global portfolio. And in the UK, it's the highest in Europe. And we see this at Antler as well. Many people aren't just applying within the UK to build a company. They're looking to come to the UK and find an amazing co-founder and build a great company long term. And then London has a high number of unicorn founders from corporate and banking backgrounds. And so this is obviously playing to what we call spikes, which is kind of the deep industry expertise. FinTech, applied AI, Google, Amazon, Apple, all their AI headquarters are here, based here in the UK, in Cambridge, in London. And then obviously in FinTech, right, we see no obvious you know, surprise there on the correlation, but people with deep finance background are going into companies and building FinTech solutions. And then lastly, there are trends within the employers. So McKinsey, Cambridge Consultants, and BSGs are the employers creating the British unicorns, as in they came from that background at those companies and they went back to build the company. And then lastly on universities, you have Oxford, Cambridge, and Manchester. Those are the leading universities that are creating the British unicorns that we're seeing today. So the key findings that we've seen across the region, and this is some interesting numbers here. So 4% of them are women, and it's across 39 nationalities. Um, these are world-class businesses, but the homogeneity is really interesting in terms of the backgrounds that these founders come from. And the alumni are from schools you probably recognize, such as Oxford, Stockholm, Munich. And then the employers, as I mentioned, is McKinsey, BCG, Rocket Internet. These are some of the companies that have built most of the European unicorns we've seen today. And then nearly half, 40%, are serial entrepreneurs. It's not their first time doing it. So the average age of founders is around 40s, early 40s. The average age of founders of unicorns is mid-30s. Um, so typically, you have quite a bit of experience in the industries that you're working in. And then we talk about these founder engines, right? This is kind of the cyclical ecosystem effect where you have investors, you have talent, they build companies and then they exit down the road. 40% um, of the UCOR founders come from 20 universities employers. It's a pretty small number. And you can see some of the ones highlighted there on the right. Now, of course, this is interesting. This is kind of the view looking backwards in the spirit of what Ed talked about. We're interested in what's coming next and what the future looks like. And I hope you get by now that Antler backs the world's most driven founders. And we're all about breaking down a lot of the barriers that have traditionally gotten in the way for founders to build a VC backable business. It's really hard to find a co-founder. Just think in your own life, how many co-founders do you know that would be qualified to leave their job and join you build a company? Can you actually get capital in the next 10 to 12 weeks? Who's gonna support you along the way with a support network of people who have deep expertise and industry experience to help you? These are all the things that at Antler we aim to obliterate through the programs that we've created and the portfolios that we're helping to build. So what we've seen, these are the trends kind of going forward towards the future. So pre-2015 unicorn founders, uh, what we see here is that 35% of the, the pre-2015 unicorn founders are coming from the startup ecosystem, right? So these are ones who are repeat uh, people from within the ecosystem coming in to build their next company. 43% since 2015, so we're seeing an upward trajectory. And here at Antler, we're seeing about two thirds of the founders have previous startup experience. Another one, which is the percent that have a tech background, we're seeing this also trend upwards as well from 20, 30, to over 50% amongst the Antler founders that we see in Europe. And then of course for diversity, you can see here for men and women also trending to the right. Obviously a lot more progress to be had here, but at Antler 35% of our portfolio companies have a female co-founder. And that's significantly higher than the industry norm. 
And then when you look at nationalities, kind of like what Ed was mentioning, we now see unicorns all over the world across many countries. It's not coalesced and focused on specific geographies anymore. We're seeing this talent and the experience across the world and across many nationalities. We have our eight nationalities in Antler's global portfolio, and you can see the Europe's unicorn founders goes up from 39 nationalities to over 150 for aspiring founders. Now, counterintuitively, We've seen a lot over the past few years with layoffs and companies decreasing in size, economic uncertainty. And this is one of those things where it's a huge thing for entrepreneurship. I mean, I think we all know that this is the time when great companies are built. Huge pain points, deep experience, applying it to pressing problems, a lot of the ones that Ed just covered. We've seen a huge increase in the number of founders from companies after they announce significant layoffs. This is a time to build a company and take that experience and apply it to a problem that they want to solve. Um, you heard about the PayPal Mafia in Silicon Valley and all the great companies that have come out of that group. When you've got companies like Klarna, Revolut, and Spotify, and Uber, and others, they're now spinning off alumni that are going back to create companies on their own. And many of these companies that you see here are represented in the portfolio and within the residencies that we build at Antler. To give you one example of diversity and backgrounds, um, this is a company called Blend, which is built for smarter onboarding. Um, and so if you think about hospitality and how hard it is to get staff on board and train them and get them to a level of competency where they could do well, and on top of that, you've got the pressures of Brexit where people suddenly didn't have a visa and right to work. There was a huge outflow of talent. And there was a gigantic revenue opportunity missing, 21 billion in the UK due to staff shortages. So a really good example of a pressing problem solved due to topical things that we're seeing in the market, backed by three founders, two of them are female, one of them from Ukraine, and you can see the journey here from Antler. So this team was just in the past year, just 10 months ago. Uh, we did an initial investment at 1.2 million valuation, and now they've raised over 200,000 pounds from leading hospitality and EdTech angel investors. So a good example of a team with an interesting background, and in the case of Helen, she's a background in low-code, no-code. Julia and Jonah have deep background in brand management and creating a great onboarding experience for companies. I mentioned Uber earlier. Julia was at Uber before joining Antler. So those are some examples of founder backgrounds, the numbers, what we're seeing at the European level and also in the UK. A little bit about industries with traction. So I mentioned earlier we have about 90 portfolio companies. The stats that we're seeing with our companies, frankly, for pre-seed and seed is pretty stable. You see a lot of more movement up and down within Series A and later. 85% um, of our companies are, have a higher survivability rate, and what that means is only 15% have closed since joining. 86% raise funding within the first 12 months versus an industry average of 60%. I mentioned the 35% female founder ratio within our portfolio. And then an NPS of over 60, which you take a lot of pride in. Um, so about 40% of our founders get investment when they go through the program. Um, but that 60 plus includes everyone, even the ones that don't get funding. And so they take that as a great experience to grow their skill set and to come out of it stronger. For the breakdown, I mentioned we're industry agnostic. I think this chart kind of proves it. A lot of people kind of see what it looks like visually, but you can see the breakdown here across the different industries. Um, in FinTech, for example, 16% of our portfolio. And as I've mentioned, we specialize in pre-seed and seed stage, which you see on the top right. Um, and then of course, the source, which is also mostly antler source within the residency program. Some of the key findings is that 35 industries across portfolio. Um, so we, we, we've invested across over 35 different industries. The outlier performance, we talked about the numbers who've gone on to raise funding, and those are still surviving, and also the amount they've been able to raise in the first year and a half. And then lastly, on the portfolio support, um, we talked about the key part of partnerships and being able to follow on and provide valuable advice and guidance to our venture partners and our global advisors. For the global advisors, it's over 800 people around the world. This includes the former CTO of Spotify. Here in the UK, we have the co-founder of Monzo, co-founder of Gorillaz. We even have a full-time CEO coach. Um, these are all people that we make available to help out our teams as they grow. Last bit on trends of the future. So this is what we're seeing in the cohort and kind of how it informs our view and what we're seeing. Look, I think it's, you know, the word AI hasn't been mentioned yet in this presentation. Um, obviously it's a top one that we're looking at and seeing, in particular applied AI, and in particular here in the UK. We're seeing it resulting in longer runways through lowering costs for businesses to get off the ground and also more impactful solutions. Um, I did a panel with AWS just the other week on this topic. And a lot of it is everyone's going to be impacted by AI in some way, whether you're applying it directly to your business or how you respond to it competitively with what others are doing in the market. And so we're seeing this as a key thing that you know, companies across the board are investing in and building on. And it does result in longer runways because costs are able to be lowered because of it. One example of AI is Vamstar. So Vamstar is a RFP marketplace for hospitals. Um, and so they started in Antler four years ago, team of three. 
Um, and you can see here that they've done 3 million ARR secured since 2020. They have 86,000 hospitals across 100 companies. And the basic problem is this that they're solving, is how do you do RFPs to find suppliers for your hospital? They have deep expertise in the health tech industry, deep expertise with hospitals. Think about it back in COVID days, you want to get a mask, who do you source it from, how much does it cost, how soon will it get here, what's the quality of the supplier? So they really helped solve this problem. And you can see their journey since then. And so they've gone on to raise several significant rounds. Their most recent round was $10 million plus, um, backed by Elevate, B2V, Begin Partners, and Angels. And so been able to get some great co-investors on board as they've grown from the Antler residency. Second trend, ESG impact is a key priority for founders. So when you do bottom-up innovation, right, we have, what, 120,000 applicants a year, 3% come through to the program globally. It's bottom-up. And so they're telling us what they want to work on, what they see the problem is. And so ESG is a big one. And so 40% of our portfolio is rated impact investments, as rated by the UN. Good example of that is CloudCycle. And when we talk about ESG at Antler, it's not just about doing social good and social impact. It's also about creating great companies that can create great value and make a big impact for customers. So at CloudCycle, um, this team here you see Russell and Ed, um, so CEO, CTO, again, international. Um, background here is concrete quality, how it's done historically. It's called clumping. It's where you pour concrete into a cone, you take a giant rod, you knock it down several times, and then you remove the cone and you measure with a tape measure to see how far it's gone down. That's how it's done. And it's done on 5% of concrete, not all of it. So what happens is people overorder concrete because they don't know what the quality of the concrete will be. And so we estimate that if everyone used CloudCycle, and it's a hardware service, hardware and software service that goes on to look at monitor 100% of the concrete that goes through, you'd save a 1% in CO2 emissions globally. A huge impact. And it does that through assessing all the concrete all the time so you don't have to overorder. So their journey since Antler has been quite spectacular as well. Started about four years ago. You can see it's going up now. And they're currently doing a 7 million pound round. So big impact, um, great example of ESG, making a huge impact on social. And you can see on the top right there some of the um, sustainable development goals that it affects. Um, great progress. And again, a team that came out of the residency program. Third one to highlight. Um, deep sector expertise mixed with tech founder skills is resulting in niche market solutions. So there are some markets that are just huge. And so if you could generate a big impact within a niche segment, you can unlock significant value. Good example of that is Baseline. Baseline was founded by Boris. Uh, this is developer-first observability for serverless architectures. And basically, there were giant companies that had huge problems because they weren't monitoring the quality of code before release. And this has become particularly acute since AI. Um, and so you're able to work with Bard and others in order to monitor your code and make sure you're catching problems before they become problems. What's also interesting about Baseline is within three months after joining Antler, uh, after the investment, um, Sequoia Capital invested them as part of their ARC program, which is for 10 companies in Europe that they invested in. And so the valuation went up 8x um, within four months after they finished Antler. So another good example, you know, kind of like a specific solution, applying deep expertise and applying it to current problems and current technology we're seeing today. Also backed by Octopus and Forward Partners. So I hope that gives you an idea of what I'm talking about when we say what founders we're looking at, who we're backing, the trends that we're seeing, why it's an exciting time to be building companies and also investing in companies, and also some real example of traction of companies that have made significant impact in applied AI, ESG, and also looking at AI. And then you can see here some of the examples of companies around the world. So these are some of the headlines of companies that have raised in across the locations, across the 25 plus locations. Um, so I hope this gives you kind of further context of what we mean by from day zero to greatness. Um, if you want to read more about the report, we've got the European Tech Founders Report. This is what it looks like if you open it up. Um, it's on antler.co. They got that right, Jack? Um, check it out. Uh, full more depth insights in terms of the numbers, key findings, what we're seeing in diversity, growth sectors, and engines across the European region. Thank you very much. We're going to take a break. We've got drinks and snacks over to the right. All right. Good afternoon, everyone. I hope you're having a very enjoyable afternoon. Um, so we've heard insights into the current and future state of the industry from Mr. Ed Knight. Um, and we've also heard perspectives into the changing demographics of Europe's tech founders from Mr. Jed Rose. A few things I've taken away um, for us to set us up really, really nicely for this panel are one, there's a remarkable explosion in innovation that we're seeing in recent years, and Antler is positioned um, as a central force behind that transformational change. And then second, there's a new generation of tech founders and the overall health 
of the European tech ecosystem looks stronger than ever. Now, get ready, as over the next half an hour or so, we will build on what we've learned earlier by hearing from four leading VCs. Our discussion that we'll have will be a unique opportunity to hear directly from those who are speaking to Founders Daily, seeing firsthand that innovation that we've heard about earlier today, and based on that, making key investment decisions as to where to invest to in this evolving market, and what opportunities they're most excited about. So let me introduce you to our brilliant panelists. Beatrice, who is a principal at Lakestar, Hanel, who is a principal at Creandum, Laura, who is a principal at Early Bird, and Rodney, who is blessed amongst women, is a partner at Cornerstone. Please give them a warm welcome. So let's kick off the discussion. Beatrice, I'd love to start with you. Lakestar has invested in some of Europe's most successful tech companies, including Revolut, Spotify, and Builder, which is a, a recent unicorn. Uh, these companies have been hit hard by the downturn. Um, what advice have you been giving to your portfolio companies based on that? Hi, everybody. Um, mainly, I mean, I think the, the usual advice that we give is probably threefold. One is that it's probably not going to be news to anybody. It's conserve cash as much as possible. We were fortunate enough that we didn't really do many of those hype investments on the hype cycle and peak, peak valuation. So we were not really stuck with a lot of the portfolio with like unachievable next rounds. But still, you know, founders have to assume that maybe for the next two years, they, they will not be able to fundraise. So cash, conserve cash as much as possible. Typically, two years of runway, that's like the ballpark that we're looking for. And even when we were making new investments, uh, it used to be you raise X amount for 12 months, and now it's X amount for 24 to 30. So very, very long runway. Um, if the portfolio has done cuts, it's probably the majority was like between 10 to 20% of the workforce. Make cuts very, very early and very deep, but don't go through multiple rounds of firings that basically, I think, erode the culture and people are like just waiting for the next round of firings and they don't, they're not really productive. So if people were doing cuts, like doing very, very early on and very deep. And then third is probably also like renegotiate all your vendor contracts as much as possible. Um, and that goes back to the first point, which is conserving cash. Um, it is possible to fundraise in this environment. Very, very hard. Builder is a good example. Um, they raised Series D just last summer, 250 million. So they achieved unicorn status. Uh, but people should not go off the assumption that they raise, they, they're able to fundraise, basically. That's what Donna. we say. Hanel, we'll jump to you. Um, you've been an investor in the US and have recently made the move to the UK over the last year or so. Can you share in some of the observations that you've, uh, that kind of makes you personally excited about the UK tech scene right now? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I guess maybe by, by way of uh, background, I'm American, as you can hear from the accent. And before moving to London and joining Creandum, I was an investor at a fund out of New York called Union Square Ventures, or USV. And before that, I actually spent some time at Insight Partners, which is a big growth fund out of the US. So most of my investing experience is actually in the US. And the last 10, 11 months at Creandum have sort of been an introduction to, uh, to investing in Europe and, and the landscape in the UK um, in particular. You know, we were uh, talking about this before. I, I feel like I often get asked sort of like the differences between the two. And I think, um, I mean, in some ways, the biggest difference is just that the US has a much more mature ecosystem. So there's much more growth capital, for example. And often, our portfolio companies at Creandum will raise a seed round or Series A round in Europe and then look towards the US to raise growth capital. But I think at the very early stage, like pre-seed and seed and Series A investing, it's, uh, it's very similar in both geographies. Like the competition is fierce on both uh, the founder side to build big businesses and also on the investor side. Um, I think the, the biggest difference, and I guess this is probably fairly obvious to most people in the room, is that Europe and the UK as well have these sort of more local Ecosystem. So often a question we ask, less so actually when we look at companies in London, but more so when we look at companies in Paris or Berlin is sort of like, 
is the product and are the founders aiming to build a pan-European global company or is this really a product and go, you know, market that is very local to one country? And, and that dynamic doesn't exist in the US because the US is a massive market. You can build a product and sell it across coast to coast and, and build very big businesses. So that's maybe one dynamic that, um, that we think about. But I think the thing that is really exciting to me actually about investing in London, and we do a lot of investing in the UK, is that um, London is such a hub for talent from all over Europe and the world that many of the companies we've backed in London, like the, the founders actually are from elsewhere and they just, they build great businesses here and there's just amazing schools and talent and, and businesses like Google and others that have offices here. So I think there is a lot of potential um, in, in the UK that gets us very excited. Fantastic. Rodney, we'll go to you. Um, as a partner of a $25 million um, UK fund that invests in pre-seed and seed companies, um, backing diverse founding teams, should we say, uh, you work closely with entrepreneurs from the very beginning of their journeys. Um, how has the tech um, downturn impacted what you're looking for in pitches? And then really a question, what technologies are still attracting investment? Yeah, um, great question and hi everybody. Um, so we're a diversity-led um, investment firm and we invest at pre-seed and seed into uh, founders building interesting innovative businesses and trying to tackle problems that historically have been ignored. And I think that's still the case even in a downturn. If anything, the opportunity is greater because in a downturn, um, there's a tendency for top tier VC funds or larger funds to kind of consolidate, focus on their portfolio companies, focus on following on into their existing positions as opposed to taking additional risk. And as an emerging ma a manager with lots and lots of dry powder, we get naturally inundated with some really exciting, innovative opportunities. But that's great, because we're on the front foot and we want to invest in the downtown. We want to invest at the bottom of the vintage, because we think this is where we can make a lot of money. Um, so, so that's the thing that I think we really, really focus on. One of the things that I think we're very nervous of is sort of bubbles, potential bubbles that are starting to, to kind of crop up and a lot of noise. And so trying to find the signal within the noise. A great example is generative AI. You know, every deck that I see <laughs> seems to claim to be an AI driven business, but the reality is that they're not. And they've just almost tacked AI retrospectively into the business. And so that's kind of like a massive red flag to me when I look at a business that fundamentally isn't AI driven, but is pretending to be so because that's the hot buzzy word of the, of the moment. So, you know, as an emerging manager, we, we tend to shy away from those types of opportunities and really focus on what's going to move the needle in a, in a material way. Um, I'd say the other thing that I think is really interesting is, is focusing on founders that really are mission aligned and are, who really like have an innate passion for what they're building, which means that whether there's fluctuations, ups and downs, macroeconomic changes, inflation rate spirals out of control, you're kind of all committed, you're all in, right? You've got no other option. There's almost like a bit of a, I wouldn't say desperation, but there's a bit of a kind of, it's 100% or nothing. You know, we, we love finding those types of founders because we know that regardless of the environment they're operating in, they're gonna find a way to win. Love it. Thanks, Rodney. Laura, we'll come to you next. Um, you've recently joined Early Bird, congrats. Thanks. Um, the fund has been around since 1997, but would love to get your thoughts on what sectors that you see as high potential and poised for growth over the next decade. Yes, absolutely. Um, hi, everyone. Um, I think it would be weird now to not mention AI, although <laughs> Rodney was a little bit skeptical. Uh, but actually, I think we don't see it as much as a sector per se, but rather more of a, a platform shift that will affect all sectors uh, out there. So um, I think there's this notion where like in all previous platform shifts like mobile, cloud, the internet, uh, sooner or later e every company needs to have some uh, level of AI embedded in their product. And I think that's a little bit what you're touching on. It's, it's, it will be less of a ticket to win, but more of a ticket to play. Um, so having said that, I think there will still be some companies that are AI native that wouldn't have been 
able to exist without this kind of new level of like gen AI. Um, so similar to maybe Uber in the mobile uh, shift, uh, you know, there will be companies, you know, in the AI field uh, coming up uh, that are completely you know, AI native. Um, so we're still very, we're still very excited about the space, and specifically, I would say maybe the infrastructure layer. Uh, we're actually made investments in the foundational model layer as well, although it's it's kind of there. I would say fewer VCs are making bets. Um, but besides AI, then I think in other space we are quite excited about and think we'll see a big technological shift the next decade is is um, the energy sector. Um, and there we're looking, as a fund, we're looking at, at opportunities across the whole energy value chain and hardware and software. So from production to storage to consumption, consumption distribution. Um, so that's another one. The fund as such, we are, we're pretty broad. We look across like enterprise software, fintech, deep tech. Um, so I think within each subcategory within these three pockets, there are, let's say, pocket of opportunities that we are more excited about and less. So um, I think overall there's, there's like, I think a lot of exciting stuff coming up in the next decade. For sure. Thank you, Laura. Beatrice, back to you. So the European founder report that Jed just provided insights into shows an injection of highly skilled uh, founder talent entering the market. So people with direct experience in the, in the sector, in the, in the tech sector. Um, are you seeing that trend in new founders that you meet? Um, and do you think there's a sign of growing maturity in the European um, tech ecosystem? For sure. I'm actually going to connect to what Laura just said. She said that in the next 10 years, we're going to see these very exciting things. That's also as a result of incumbents not, not hiring, and actually people being, being laid off by tech companies, um, there will be a new wave of founders that will have new ideas. And I also probably am more with Laura with like the AI craze. It is a bit of a craze, um, but realistically everything will probably incorporate some level of AI. But for sure, I think UK is already a very mature ecosystem. There's been like multiple uh, sort of like cycles of unicorns and then people that have spun out of those unicorns. We see it with Revolut, for example, and there's probably uh, two businesses that we actually backed out of Revolut. Um, Spotify as well, same, same thing. Um, but I also see a lot of maturity. I also personally cover, I'm Italian, so I, and I speak a bit of Spanish, so I, I cover Southern Europe. Um, Spain has seen a tremendous growth over the past two years. We've seen already founders graduating from Spanish unicorns going back and you know, we're seeing <coughs> seed funding. That's amazing to see. Italy is maybe a little bit less um, evolved in that sense, but also Eastern Europe, so, and then the Nordics, of course. But I think Germany, uh, Paris, the Paris, France, UK, and Nordics are maybe a little bit more mature, but you see a lot coming out of Southern and Eastern Europe now. Um, probably the best example is like one recent company that we backed in, it's a gaming studio out of uh, Riot. Uh, so they, they worked on uh, Fortnite, League of Legends, et cetera. Um, but they're uh, remote founders. One is in Sweden, one is in Italy. They hired developers in Puglia uh, that actually has a very, very high quality of developers at a fraction of a cost of LA. And so also as a result of the pandemic, there's, there's more movement on also the remote working and startups really emerging from anywhere. And we love to see that. I also want to maybe specify one other thing. I love investing in first time founders and it's not necessarily that, you know, you have a certain experience in as a founder, two or three startups before you're like multiple time founders that uh, VCs are not going to look at founders in, you know, if they're first time uh, founders. I love doing that. Um, also because I think what is was, what was the rule and the framework of thinking of the next uh, of the last 10 years it's not necessarily the framework that is going to be applied over the next 10 years and so also this innovation in also you know new founders popping out that's that's amazing to me thank you Beatrice Rodney on to a slightly different topic. Um, as an emerging manager, what signs do you look for when you think about backing founders that will define that next decade? So we, um, we're kind of a little bit unusual in that we have a diversity-led investment thesis, which basically means that we focus on the team rather than on the product or on the market. And when we think about the team, we think about it in the context of sort of two lenses, which is what we refer to as inherent diversity. So 
diversity of Bournemouth. So whether that's your um, ethnicity, ethnic background, your age or your biological gender. And then the second lens is kind of what we refer to as your acquired diversity. So diversity that you accumulate through your life experiences, whether that's the types of universities you went to, uh, your social capital that's shaped by your socioeconomic background, whether it's languages that you speak, your cultural sensitivities because of where you've traveled, where you've spent your time. And when we look at both of those lenses, then we can form a picture of the team in its full kind of complete sense in terms of diversity in the much broader sense. So this isn't about backing a team because you've got a black person on the board. It's not about being tokenistic in that sense. And I think often when people think about diversity focused funds, they think about this sort of tokenistic approach. Our view is that the next decade is gonna be much more focused on the team and what the inherent skill set, advantages, perspectives of the team have collectively to solve new problems, new and novel problems that are affecting the world on a global scale. So that's how we think about um, opportunities. Thematically, we invest across three kind of key areas, sustainability, automation, and networks. Sustainability because we've got to address the net zero challenge. And actually, net zero is not just simply about climate change. It's much more about how do we become much more efficient about the resources that we're using across the planet, just generally. Automation, because although we've got an explosion in, in technology, rates of productivity globally are at record lows. So we as humans are either becoming lazier or we just don't know how to use technology particularly well. So what's, what's going on? And then the final theme is all around networks. You know, we're increasingly in a polarized, globalized society where we're going to extremes on the left and extremes on the right. How do we bring people back together and focus on more network-driven businesses? That's how we think about the sort of the trends and the shape of things to come in the next decade. Brilliant. Thank you, Rodney. Um, Laura, switching gears slightly. Um, what do you think are some of the biggest structural challenges that stand in the way of both UK and European tech founders? Um, and there, are there any specific examples that you have? Yeah. Um, I think this largely depends on which sector you're operating in and what business model do you have. Um, but I would say across the board, in, one thing I can think of uh, would be um, access to go-to-market talent, like really seasoned go-to-market talent. I think that's something, uh, if compared to US, that you, the Hannah mentioned, like we're a li little bit less mature over here. And I think one area that we see that in our portfolio, but also the fund I worked in before, you know, the more mature portfolio companies, when you're really in the stage of growth and, and need to replicate your uh, go-to-market playbook across new product lines and markets, uh, you know, I think when you need to make those hires into like the C-level commercial side, the CCO, CRO, uh, it's, it's quite scarce uh, here. Specifically, I think UK or sp more specifically London is definitely an advantage here compared to other European hubs. Um, but that's something that I think, yeah, we're still a little bit behind. Uh, if, you, if you flip and then look at tech talent and product talent, I think that's like really like flourishing over here, like here. But yeah, less so on the go-to-market side. Um, in general, I, I think it's, it's always interesting to make the comparison with the US because they, like, they are 10, 15 years ahead of us, so you could make the comparison, okay, where are we, where are they, where do, what, what are we missing to kind of get to that level? And I think uh, few, we've really come a far way the last 10 years. Um, I think the kind of, I said the tech talent is here. Uh, we, I think we make great products that are quite often even superior to, to the, the American uh, counterparts. I think the early stage found financing is, is like I would argue almost too crowded. Um, um, and I think what we've seen also, I think it was Beatrice making the point, like we see these, we have seen a couple of these very big tech exits the last couple of years here in Europe that is kind of creating this flywheel effect of like, you know, new cohorts or graduates of tech companies creating that, not only the founders, but you know, people in the mid-level management or senior management that are, you know, either cashed out and are now starting doing angel investments themselves is a great flourishment to the to the city to the ecosystem, but also starting their new uh, companies. So I think 
that's I think we're getting more and more of, but it's it's more yeah than to the later stages where we're still a bit behind. Like you mentioned it, Handel mentioned it before, like growth capital, exit avenues. Uh, often, you know, as European or UK companies, we need to look at the US almost to realize that and to raise a Europe, the US growth capital, you need oftentimes traction in the US, so it forces you to make the, the leap over there. So I think that could be a challenge as well. Um, so I think there is where we still have, have way to go over here. Um, yeah. Very good. Thank you, Laura. Beatrice. Um, Early stage investment has remained resilient, but do you think down rounds, layoffs, and a drop in later stage funding will make it harder to raise um, from Series C and beyond? I get all the pessimistic questions. <laughs> 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 so yes, definitely. Um, we're still in a market correction. I think everything kind of crumbled down on the public markets um, sort of a year, year and a half ago. Actually, coincidentally, when I joined Lakestar. Um, and so we're still in that uh, sort of back solving from there, like working backwards from the public markets to the early stage. I would actually argue that, yes, early stage financing has been resilient, but I've seen, I used to see so many like 10 million seed at 50 post, and now a lot of what I see is two at 10. So there's been a correction there as well. <laughs> and I think you, you, when series A to series D, you're trying to bridge the gap between the early stage where everything is in the future and you have to you have a great idea and you have to prove everything in the future to the public markets where you're valued essentially on what you've done in the past um, which has its own problems but like bridging the two if you bridge them as much as possible and so by series a series b you're already building a good track record and you're switching from you know growth at all costs everything that's in the future to actually have achieved a lot of things um, then there's a more probability to get funded at, at growth stage. It's a very difficult balance to achieve because also you don't want to go too conservative where you like conserve cash and you don't take risks because otherwise you're not going to innovate. But a good balance between the two, and that's, what, that's what's needed. Um, and, you know, growth funds are, growth rounds are still happening, but they're very, um, the majority of them are very textbook perfect LTV CAC, 50% plus growth. So it's, there's a lot more attention to the metrics and to the track record. So it, yeah, that's, it's difficult, but it's not impossible. I actually, and I, yeah, oh, sorry. sorry, go on. No, no, go, I, I was gonna say, I, um, I think there's also been a big cutoff between a, a big difference now in what you need to raise a series A. Like I think yeah. the big difference, at least in, on the early stage side is that, um, Two years ago, you can sort of raise a Series A six months after raising a seed round with sort of like a few proof points. And, and I think the drop off or the conversion rate, I saw some statistic on this recently, and maybe this was in the report as well, is like much, much lower. And like we're sort of seeing companies closer to 2 million ARR before they raise a Series A than, you know, 500K or, or whatever it was two years ago. Absolutely. So. And I think there's also a bit of, um, I want to say sheep mentality, but it is sheep mentality when it comes to VC, where you know if you're a Series A fund, you're constantly looking at what the growth investors are doing, so you're trying not to take risks because you want your portfolio to be uplifted. And then if you're seed, you can take more risks. But like it's a bit of a, a bit of a vicious circle until something <coughs> unlocks and somebody takes a risk again, and then everybody takes a risk consequential to that. But it's it's a very it's more of a behavioral psychology thing more than anything else, I think, sometimes. So basically Unfortunately. Basically, nobody knows what they're doing, is what you're saying. Yeah. <laughs> just going around and around. <laughs> In so a way, yes. <laughs> yes. Yeah. I think it's, it, it's so important to be fundamentally driven, and we try to be as much as possible, but there's all sort of like psychology things going on that there's. It's the dark side of VC, I think. And it's, <laughs> yeah. Unless but I'm it's the true. There. I want to be <laughs> totally politically incorrect and say that because it's it's true. Yeah. All right. And, on on my uh, one more question, okay, uh, Rodney, for you. How are we going to make the most amount of progress on diversity in UK tech over the next ten years? Um, to be honest, I just I don't think we're going to make. VC more inclusive because it's the right thing to do. I think we're going to make it more inclusive because it makes money. That's fundamentally what's going to change the dial. And so it's going to start with the LPs. The LPs are going to buy into the notion that if you back diverse founders, they, more, they make more money than if you back a non-diverse team. 
And then that's going to then flow into top tier funds having major wins in terms of exits, looking at where those wins are coming from in terms of the composition of the team. And then hopefully that will then flow into emerging managers like Cornerstone VC that have a diversity focused agenda. But it's not going to be driven by, by morality. It's just not. We're, we're a capitalist driven society. And VC is like literally at the pinnacle of capitalism, <laughs> so it's all about making money, and I'm not naive to, rec to, like, to not think that's the case. So that's how we create a more inclusive landscape. I think we found our hashtag for this event, by the way. <laughs> it's all about money. Guys and girls, we are finished with the panel. Um, we'd just like to thank all of our brilliant panelists for joining us, so please give them a hand. So the next part of this event, we're going to take a 10, 15 minute break. Drinks and snacks um, are to the right. Um, and we'll reconvene with the portfolio pitches in, let's say, 15. Thank you very much. Thank you. Hey, everybody. Can everybody cut start coming back to their seats, please? Please, can people come back to their seats? Doing my best. We're good. This is not on. No. Okay. We're going to get started in the next minute, everyone. So if you can grab your drinks and snacks and take a seat. And I'll hand it over to Tanya. Thank you. If everyone can please spread out. There's lots of seats in the middle and on this side, thanks. <laughs> right. Come on, take your seats, everyone. So moving on to the next part of today's event, where we'll hear from a select group of portfolio companies in the UK. Since its inception, Antler has played a pivotal role in fostering innovation and democratizing entrepreneurship. We have invested in 87 startups and backed teams from across 35 different sectors in the UK. The companies that you will see today are making tangible impact by addressing real world challenges. They represent a mix of teams building in different verticals and technologies, including climate tech, fintech, health tech, prop tech, consumer tech, and many, many more. So to tell you a little bit about the format, each of our portfolio companies presenting today will take the stage for a 90-second elevator pitch. In this brief time, they will present their businesses, giving you a taste of the incredible innovation happening within our ecosystem. At the networking break after the presentations, you'll have the opportunity to connect with the founders, so please don't dash off. We'll, we will also display a QR code on the screen, which was presented earlier, but it will come back on. Should you want an introduction to any of the founders directly, you can request materials and information directly. So we look forward to welcoming you for drinks afterwards. Enjoy the first company. Thank you very much. Hi everyone, 90 seconds, here we go. Um, I'm Samir and I'm the founder of Abode. Uh, Mathieu and I, my co-founder, along with our beautiful photos here, we're a highly experienced team with a track record of execution, having worked uh, in banking and private equity, but also in Europe's leading fintechs and prop techs listed along the bottom there. We're tackling, we're using that experience to tackle the very large problem of the 15 million people in the UK that should own but can't. A problem that's driven by the cost of the deposit and the fact that the increase in house prices means that mortgages are now unaffordable. A problem I'm sure a lot of us here can relate to. So we're providing an AI powered platform that's providing investors, institutional investors with access to single family rentals and creating homeowners. Customers apply to us and get a home shopping budget. They use that to find their future home somewhere they want to live for the next 20 to 25 years. We'll buy that home for them, 
at a discount and cover all of the fees. They then will rent it from us with built-in savings and a 25% lifetime ISA bonus from the government. And then they can buy it back from us at a preset price once they're ready or walk away. For the first time, we're providing customers with a digital first personalized platform that will help them transition to becoming homeowners. And starting this business in a time of dislocation, the macro environment that we spoke about earlier presents us with a lot of opportunity. Customers clearly need abode. Institutional investors need abode and landlords and developers also need our solution. We have a customer wait list of over a thousand customers. We have backing from a built to rent player supported by a 100 billion plus asset manager for access to capital. And we have discounts on properties of up to 20% from some of the UK's largest developers. So we're asking today for you to join us in helping people feel at home, but also proud, comfortable, and independent. Thank you, Samir. I can walk around, right? It's allowed. Um, anyway, I'm, uh, I'm Jonas, the CEO of Shaka. And with Shaka, we enable brands to enable we, sorry, we enable brands to offer mobile packages to their customers. Ryan Reynolds, you probably know him as that cool, or maybe the free, the free guy, some of you. But you might also know that he actually bought a partial stake in a mobile network in the US. And he leveraged his Instagram followers to drive millions of new subscribers for the network. Just recently, he sold the network to T-Mobile for over one billion. You don't have to buy an existing network to offer mobile packages though. You can set up your own network, but be ready for a lengthy and expensive legacy process that will set you back by millions and take more than a year of your life. With Shaka, you can be up and running in the matter of hours and for absolutely no cost. Picture being able to offer mobile packages to your customers with a single API call and through the eSIM technology. Go and ask your teenage daughter or son whether they'd rather be on Mr. Beast phone or Vodafone. Or would you want to jump on Revolut Mobile if it came with Revolut Metal? We have customers live on the platform and we have others with over 400,000 potential customers. We just, we just finishing a 1 million seed round. We are a team of serial entrepreneurs. I set up a telco business in the past after years as a management consultant in the telco industry. Ali actually set up two tech businesses and successfully exited one of them. And Charlie has two SaaS businesses on his resume. And that's it. Thank you and feel free to reach out. Hi everybody, my name is Maliha and I'm the CEO and co-founder at reInvent and at reInvent we are building a decentralized ad network to help direct-to-consumer brands lower their customer acquisition costs. So over the last couple of years, customer acquisition costs have doubled and this is completely destroying e-commerce businesses. This is because ads have become less effective as centralized ad networks have lost access to key data sets. In 2020, we saw I the launch of iOS 14 caused 75% of consumers opt out from sharing their data. This year, Apple have removed UTM links, killing attribution, and it's only going to get worse next year when Google remove all third-party tracking cookies so advertisers will no longer be able to track consumer behavior. Brands are actively looking for a new customer acquisition channel, and this is where we come in. At reInvent, we help brands acquire new customers through collaborations at scale using data analysis. In just three months, we've already helped 10 brands lower their customer acquisition costs by a staggering 54%. How? The process is super simple. All a brand has to do is download our app. We then segment and analyze their customer data. We then partner them with a complementary brand and we use the buzzword of the now, generative AI to create email marketing campaigns. 
We've had tremendous success so far. Two of our most successful brand partners lowered their CAC by 74% through just one campaign with our platform, and they generated over 2,000 pounds in revenue. This has led to us having a wait list of 200 brands ready to join the network. The team behind reInvent, we're all second time founders and e-commerce experts. I previously founded a sustainable packaging startup and sold products to some of the biggest names in B2B hospitality, such as Virgin, Nobu, Hilton, Intercontinental. My co-founder, Bryn Hassan, who's our CPO, he had a successful e-commerce business, which he sold last year, and Google was actually one of his biggest customers. And our CTO is, a MI, is an AI and ML specialist, and he also successfully sold his business. So if you want to have a chat, come find me, and we can talk all things e-com and CAC. Hey folks, um, I'm Colin, I'm co-founder of Noetic, and we provide seamless assessment and support for adult ADHD, autism, dyslexia, and dyspraxia. Everybody think for a moment. Have you ever been at the gym, you've been on the treadmill, you're absolutely killing it, giving it everything you've got, and you look left and right, and there's two people beside you going twice your speed, seemingly effortlessly, and you can't figure out what's going on? Well, for many neurodivergents, that's exactly what it feels like just to navigate the day-to-day -day of the professional world, feeling like you're in a universally challenging situation that other people are able to navigate seamlessly. Uh, and there's a lot of neurodivergent people, but the vast majority are undiagnosed. And when you don't have those answers, you often can't get access to the support you need uh, to thrive in, the, in your circumstances. And this is the exact situation that my co-founder, Eileen, uh, found herself in. And why is that? Well, because it can take years to get diagnosed on the NHS. If you go private, we're talking thousands of pounds, and the entire process is incredibly complicated, and you have to navigate it all yourself. Um, this is something, so I was a product director for Babylon Health, and I knew that digital health could come in to help fix this situation. So what we're building is a seamless end-to-end -end process, and we're rethinking the entire thing step by step. You start with holistic neurodivergent screening. We use that rich information to provide you with the right diagnostic and the right community support packages, while also sharing that information with clinicians to expedite the interviews so that ultimately we're able to see more people for less money. Um, this year, we've talked to hundreds of people. The market is dying for this solution. Uh, so we've been building great product. We've struck up some incredible partnerships. Uh, and we have about 70% of our pre-seed raise uh, already committed. Um, so would love to chat to anybody if you want to hear more, or also if you just want to share your own personal story about this space, come find me afterwards. Thanks. Hey everyone, uh, Yasser here, CEO of Flexor. What if I told you that you're seven times more likely to get injured, that you're sooner to die, that if you're an athlete, you're never reaching your potential, that all of these things are driven by one common factor. That's movement health, from your posture to your mobility and stability. But what's astonishing is that in today's environment, there's no way to objectively understand the quality of our movement health. That's why we're building a platform for AI-powered movement health evaluations, where we're using AI vision to scan and analyze movement, translating that into a user-friendly score and insights of different depths in order to turn that into personalized actions and next steps. We're building a library of these evaluations to help more than 1.5 million partners, from fitness platforms to corporates, insurers, and sports teams. And we're already working with a lot of elite players within these verticals. In just under six months, we've generated a strong pipeline of more than 60,000 in ARR, and we've been able to do so because we're a strong team with relative experience in sports medicine and strategy, in digital healthcare, and in AI. So if you're interested and intrigued by the impact of movement health and want to see our product in action, please connect and reach out. Thank you. I actually need to pitch now because Jed did it for us earlier. So thank you for that, Jed. So hello, everyone. I'm Jonah, co-founder and CEO of Blend. 
and we're on a mission to save business owners time and money onboarding deskless workers. Now, can everyone in this room please raise their hand if they work at a desk, either at home or in an office? The entire room. But did you know, Google, we're actually a minority and that 80% of the world's global working population are actually considered deskless. Take UK Hospitality, a beachhead market, which employs 3 million deskless workers in the UK alone. Since COVID and Brexit, a shortage of experienced workers is costing the industry significantly. However, hospitality onboarding and training is a hugely costly and repetitive process. And with staff turnover rates at a record high, it is costing our typical customer £25,000 every 90 days. There is a huge opportunity here, as everyone will agree, to automate this process and help our customers build their best teams faster. Introducing Blend, where TikTok meets workplace training for the deskless workforce. Our micro-learning platform allows operators to train and track their workforce much faster, saving our typical customer over 50K per year. And to date, we've got over 650 learners learning on the Blend platform in kitchens up and down the country and have plans to launch our V1 product across the UK into Portugal and Spain and beyond. However, hospitality is just the start. The deskless training market is a multi-billion dollar opportunity and with your support, everyone, we can help every deskless worker learn their own way. Thank you for listening. Hi everyone, my name's Craig, I'm the CEO and co-founder of GeneHub, and I'm also a rare disease patient. So what exactly does GeneHub do? We transform rare disease patient groups into research-ready data banks, all controlled by patients so that they benefit first. Rare disease is big business for Big Pharma. You can see on the left, AstraZeneca has boosted its sales by 7.1 billion last year from its rare disease portfolio. And why is this happening? Why is there an interest and an incentive for Big Pharma to move into rare diseases? Well, the UK regulators have increased the drug price cap from £30,000 to £300,000 for rare disease treatments. This is great news for the 3.5 million people in the UK that suffer from rare diseases, many of whom have no treatments. So the problem, and our solution on the right, is quite simple. On the left, the status quo is quite complex, it's really slow, and if you look at a researcher, they have to go through a number of different data silos, whether it's primary care, secondary care, or biobanks. And fundamentally, they struggle to reach back to the patient cohorts. What we do is we move the data controllers out of the picture, and we put the patient cohorts in direct contact with the researchers. And we do this with confidential computing, which allows for anonymous communication, and we can build study cohorts, we can manage the consent throughout, and we can do this with data clean rooms. And for context to put the value of those patient cohorts, those 10 patients in that bubble could be valued at about 100,000 pounds each, provided they have a whole genome sequence, their primary care records and their secondary care records. And also if you could have the ability to have post-market surveillance with them. So that bubble of 10 patients could be valued at a million pounds. Our journey so far is we're about a year into uh, the company. Uh, we've grown from two to five employees, thanks to the investment from Antler and some angels. We've just been granted an Innovate, Innovate UK uh, grant, the Biomedical Catalyst grant, which will take us up to month 30. 75% of our funding is non-dilutive. We'll be opening a seed round soon. This is our team. Uh, I'd like to point out my co-founder, Ed, uh, who also has a chronic disease, lifelong disease, so we're deeply motivated to make a change in this space. We're also supported by a number of advisors from leading pharma companies like AstraZeneca, CROs, Medical Device uh, Data Privacy, Genomics England, Bioinformatics, NHS consultants, we have a chief medical officer, and compliance and security covered. Thank you very much. Hello everyone, my name is Lucho. I'm the co-founder of Sorted. We are helping waste management companies to sort the recyclable materials. The world is fucked up. It is more expensive to buy recycled plastic than virgin one. But beyond environmental benefits, there is a lot of money in sorting plastic waste. 
the Lions to End Plastic Waste estimates that is a total missed opportunity of $133 billion because the plastic is going to the landfill, incineration, or the environment. But what is this challenging? Well, despite a lot of innovation, humans still play a big role in sorting plastic waste. In developed countries, we have optical sorters, but usually a lot of workforce manually picking waste. And in the rest of the world, all sorting, if any, is done by hand. The way I explain my solution to our mom is that we're shining lights of different colors on conveyor belts to help the humans see what they need to pick. In a more sophisticated way, we are combining computer vision with the spectroscopy to recognize everything that is going on on the conveyor belt. And we're connecting this to a laser system that is projecting lights of different colors so the humans can see what they need to recover. We started sorting just nine months ago. From the product perspective, we already trained the model, we have developed the technology, and we have deployed two facilities in the UK. And we're going to France to two more facilities this month. Actually, this morning, our first customer asked us to deploy our solution in more of their facilities here. But why are we the TL team to solve this? Well, my co-founder, he has a past experience in waste management and tech. He was the chief product officer for a startup called Waste Labs, and he has worked in Suez, one of the biggest waste management companies in the world. What about myself? Well, I'm a second time founder. My first startup was a B2B SaaS platform. I have worked on different scale ups such as Uber, Rappi, and Diri, launching and scaling up operations in different countries of Latin America, Europe, the Middle East, and Africa. Together, we're sorted. Good afternoon, Nikolai, co-founder at Genesis. We uh, are only a year old, but it was 24 years ago that I did my first expense claim. And it was seven years ago that I managed my first P&L for a multi-million dollar um, within Telco. And we are building the AI co-pilot to help run those financial operations to improve that experience. The problem that finance teams have is that CFOs, accountants, they buy tools that they need humans to drive, the bookkeepers, those in the finance teams. And they spend about $4 billion a year on those tools, which is lovely. But they spend $72 billion a year on the humans to drive it. So our opportunity, our objective, is how do we shift the human in bookkeeping process from an operator that carries an awful lot of overhead and takes about 11 minutes to complete the same task that I'm going to show you takes just 22 seconds. Jack is an AI. Jack is contextually aware to run your company's spend, approvals, reconciliation, compliance, and your payments. The entire process of an expense claim through to payment will take less than 60 seconds, but Jack is aware of all of your company policies, your regulations, your approval processes, so it's also real-time fraud detection. Over the last six months of the 12 that we've been going, this has been our traction so far. This is a wait list, but we actually have got the first clients that are paying on the platform this month. But this is the challenge that we have, 2,200 clients that are waiting to onboard, and that is our job over winter. I am increasingly an AI governance speaker, an emerging AI fraud expert, having only been in this space really for a year. Thank you very much, and please ask your portfolios how their challenges in financial operations are working out. Thank you. I'm here to introduce you the wonderfully boring world of surveys. Did you know that there's over 56 billion annual revenue within the survey industry alone, with 63% of that going to a small groups known as the US, UK, and Germany, with it growing around three billion every single year. Well, big industries come with big problems. Generally speaking, 38% of researchers that conduct these surveys struggle to actually recruit participants for these surveys. And then when they do get those people, 30% of them are the only ones actually completing them. And then it gets even worse when 40% of the potential answers are completely fraudulent or just completely bots. So we've built Kickback a gaming rewards platform that seamlessly integrates into over 2,000 video games worldwide, such as Minecraft, Roblox, you pretty much name it, it's there. 
when during the downtime of these video games, users are able to earn money and answer surveys, as well as watch ads. Now, why did we pick gaming as our first area of implementing our software? Well, on average, gamers will spend an hour and a half every single day, 365 days a year, playing these games, and on average spend 15 minutes every single day on, that, on empty space, dead time. Now, 30% of these people think gaming's far too expensive, which I have to admit myself it is. I spend far too much. And then on top of it, 41% of people make at least one purchase every single week. So looking at finding ways to mitigate all of these costs. Now, why are we the team? Well, I was a former professional video gamer where I traveled the world and had an amazing time, but I also built these teams and sold them and then finally led the strategies for some of the biggest video game launches in the world. I'm not doing this alone, fortunately. I've got my wonderful co-founder, Jack, who previously led a software and hardware company where he sold over 4 million products. We've got Rashid, who previously came from Innova uh, Innovation at Kantar. And we've got Danielle, who previously worked for places like Xbox Leading Community. But fortunately, we were backed by some amazing angel investors, such as people from Deliveroo, the NASDAQ, as well as Tencent. Now, you might be thinking, where are we so far? Well, we've been able to reduce the fraud rate by over 75% when it comes down to surveys, over 80,000 questions answered, and 6,000 users since July. But it gets even better. We're growing rapidly at 90% every month, and we're spending $0 on acquiring all of these users. And we're expected to have over 20,000 monthly active users by the end of the year. And to add to all of our surveys, we've got 1.5 million in our inventory at any given moment getting ready to answer. These come from places such as Prodigy, Synth, Taluna, and honestly, many, many more. I'm looking forward to transforming the very boring world of surveys, and hopefully you are too. Hello, uh, I'm Philip, the founder and CEO of Makersuite, and together with Davide and Felix, um, we are decoding storytelling. We're doing this because storytelling or great storytelling drives business success. It shapes our culture and our identity and our understanding of the world. And we strongly believe that it is those who tell the most uh, compelling stories and therefore build trust with their audience uh, that are going to be the most successful. But telling a great story with video is quite difficult. It takes a lot of time um, and uh, many different skill sets. In fact, in 2022, over 200 billion have been spent on the creation, distribution, and analysis of video content. So when looking at the market and the competitive landscape, what you can see is that most competitors are actually focusing on the later stages of the video creation process, namely recording and post-production. But what they, they're assuming that uh, um, users know exactly what they're doing, but our research and hundreds of interviews that we have conducted show that the opposite is the case and that these tools still leave the user with a very steep learning curve um, and very high frustration levels. Because of this, we have developed or are developing Makersuite, a data-driven and AI-enabled uh, cont video content pre-production platform that analyzes millions of videos um, in order to find patterns and learn uh, what storylines work best. And since our launch in May uh, 2023, we have acquired over 8,000 users. Uh, we've um, analyzed over 6 million videos, collected over 85 million data points, and um, we are positioning ourselves at the intersection of user information, um, video data, and generative AI, allowing us to reimagine how video is produced in the future. We are currently raising our seed rounds, and if you find interesting what we're working on, uh, please connect. I'm grabbing the mic, which means we're at the halfway point. So one more time, a hand for our first 10 companies. <laughs> I hope you're enjoying it. Um, obviously, industry agnostic, I wasn't kidding, as you saw with the first 10 businesses. We're taking a five minute break now, and then we'll resume with our next 10 companies. Thanks, everyone. Hi, everyone. My name is Pippa. I am a former formulation chemist and now co-founder and CEO at Renewed. Did you know that the average UK woman is wasting 617 pounds and nine working days of research every year on the wrong skincare products? But despite this investment, her skin is often left off worse than when she started, 
with no clear insight into how to achieve the results she wants. We launched Renew to offer a simpler, smarter way to shop for skincare by offering personalized routines and advice at scale. We do this using computer vision skin diagnostics to analyze the skin, then applying machine learning to create a step-by-step -step skincare routine designed to deliver results. This proprietary technology has been built from over 2 million data points by our team of dermatologists, doctors, formulation chemists, estheticians, data scientists, and computer vision engineers. So we can say we have truly built AI that can think like an expert. Since our launch, we've made over 100,000 recommendations and collected a proprietary data set, 50,000 images, and 20,000 product reviews, with over 94% of our community seeing visible improvements in their skin. We've been offering this service directly to consumers since launch and have recently unlocked a new phase of growth through B2B partnerships, with an ultimate goal to put a personal skin expert in every pocket. To try our service for yourself, head to renew.co. Thank you so much for listening. Hello. Ah, right, I did come up at the right time. Hello, I'm Aaron, CEO and co-founder of Hydrologic. So we're unlocking the value in the off-grid hydrogen supply chain to remove diesel from construction, film and TV, festival and events, and off-grid battery electric vehicle charging. Now, there is a $327 billion diesel machinery market that's ending, or at least needing to transition. And hydrogen and its derivatives look set to be the leading fuel to do that. Now, this is an absolutely massive opportunity, and I think we heard earlier about some of these big shifts. It's kind of a once-in-a-generation shift of fuel. Now, hydrogen has some adoption and scaling challenges. The customer have no capability to deploy this machinery. There's a disconnected supply chain that's opaque and total lack of standards within it. And for everyone, there's high barriers to entry. So that's where we step in. We solve those adoption and scaling challenges. Our customer-facing uh, services provide them with the solutions they need, whether it's from planning right through to the site engineers who do the work on the ground. And on the supply chain, our software and hardware solutions, that platform integrates the supply chain to remove the scaling challenge, together unlocking those challenges and unlocking this market. Now, we are driving real change already. We've moved over 200 businesses forward with their hydrogen plans. We are trusted by both the customers and the suppliers to deliver when it commercially matters, and we've got a strong pipeline into next year. Now, if you'd like to find out more about hydrogen, you wonder, you know, my views on hydrogen versus batteries, I don't think it's an or. Um, or if you think you can answer the question, how many more times CO2 emissions are emitted every year than diesel, uh, yeah, than diesel powered machinery, in diesel powered machinery than cars, please come talk to me afterwards. Hello everyone, my name is Enrico Faccioli, I'm the CEO and co-founder at CData. Thanks for having me. Almost three years ago, I received an email from a large airline in the UK saying that my personal data, alongside the data of other three million customers, got breached. What really struck me was the fact they said it took them six months to know they had been breached. And unfortunately, this is way too common. So. Alongside with my co-founder, Matt Holland, who's a veteran in the cybersecurity space with over 20 years of experience as a CISO, we're solving the big issue of cybersecurity incidents that go undetected for way too long, causing massive financial damages to companies globally. And today, we're making it impossible for attackers to hide in the shadows. We've built a SaaS platform that automatically deploy traps decoys inside of our customers' organizations. We monitor for any legitimate inter interaction with those traps. We analyze all the events and alert our customers when it really matters. Our customers are loving it. Uh, we're growing fast with household names, including UK's largest hotel chain, Europe's largest DIY retailer, large insurance companies. 
And if you also believe that the void should be a safer place and you want to be part of the solution, please reach out. Thank you. Whilst it's loading, uh, Max from Track Titan here, and let's talk about the sports opportunity of the 21st century: motorsports. Might seem small, but has more than a billion fans already, growing at more than 30% annually in key markets such as the U.S. And importantly, fans make more than double the income than your average football fan. But the problem is, as a fan, it's actually quite distant and unpersonalized to engage with, right? I mean. Who watches 20 idiots drive in circles? Me and apparently another billion people. But whilst fans are usually left on the sidelines, where they want to be is in the pit lane. Of course, we can't get everyone physically into that pit lane, but we can bring the pit lane and its insights right to your phone by building what we call the home of motorsports. Track Titan is your one stop solution for extremely personalized insights as a motorsports fan, giving you the insights and the updates that really matter to you as an individual fan. And that's not just some pie in the sky idea. That's an actual monetized product with more than 200K in ARR and a conversion to paying of consistently well above 15%. How did we get here? We're a team of startup and motorsport fanatics. That was, that's what makes Track Titan what it is today. We have built and scaled startups all the way from day zero to post unicorn status with some great VCs such as Picas Capital, KKR, and Tiger Global joining in those rounds. Besides that, some of us, like myself, are actual uh, professional racing drivers. So usually I'd be standing in a racing suit, but Antler said it was smart casual. So not the day for it. Uh, we couldn't do that ourselves, right? We're very lucky to have some amazing venture capital funds and co corporate VCs on board. One of them, of course, being Antler, but some really important strategic ones, such as car manufacturer Porsche, the Blackstone-backed sports betting company Superbet, and Europe's biggest media publisher, Axel Springer. So if you'd like to chat about either upcoming round or about why Ferrari is still so bad in F1, please get in touch after this. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Oh, there we go. Hi, I'm Daniel, founder of Calda, and we're building the future of inclusive mental health. One in two people in the LGBTQ plus community will experience depression every year, but they're not alone. You're more than three times more likely to experience a mental health issue if you, ha if you come from a marginalized group. But access to services is broken, with waiting lists up to two years, the costs of private therapy being too expensive, and there aren't enough therapists with the relevant lived experience to help. But what if we could revolutionize mental health support for all uh, intersectional groups. And the answer is Calda, a digital mental health app providing uh, video therapy sessions and journaling. We're able to provide immediate, low cost, and personalized evidence based therapy adapted to marginalized identities. And, we're, and our results are incredible. We're already able to achieve clinically significant reductions in anxiety and depression. And we've been featured in major press, including Forbes. Digital Health London, and Sifted. Our team have run clinical trials, built multiple medical devices, and launched apps to millions of users. So here's the opportunity. LGBTQ plus mental health is worth 48 billion pounds globally, with a subscription and courses business model that's 22 times cheaper than the cost of one-on-one -on -one therapy. So if you believe in the future of inclusive mental health, Join the rainbow revolution today. Thank you. Hello, everyone. I'm Erdem, co-founder at Flola. And with Flola, we help revenue teams build interactive deal rooms that wow buyers. That was on me, sorry. All right. Yeah, we help, in, we help revenue teams build deal rooms that wow buyers. If you're not using our product, you're probably running your sales process on email threads and spreadsheets. You're probably losing key messages, your next steps are getting missed, and 60% of your deals end in no decision. Your buyers, they're worse off 
Whether you realize it or not, they're getting scared away by this complexity. So that's why we built Flola. Interactive deal rooms that wow buyers. They are step-by-step -step journeys. They're designed to flow like Instagram stories, and they help you unify everything in one link, align all stakeholders in one page, and channel all this activity and insights back to your CRM for data-driven decisions and automations. If one of our customers sent you a flow, you would click that link and land on this page, custom branded for you. You'd be able to view all relevant materials. You'd see next steps. You'd have your questions answered right inside this UI, and it wouldn't be easier to bring in the rest of the stakeholders. This experience helped us reach 10,000 flows created in the 12 months after we launched. These flows were viewed by 50,000 happy prospects around the world. And our funding team has built products, laid sales teams, and has successfully exited a sales tech business in the past. And we're committed to leading Flowla into being the default medium for collaborative pr processes between different businesses. So if you're curious to see how the Flowla experience feels like, just like 50,000 other happy prospects, scan this QR code, try it for yourselves, and reach out. Thank you. everyone. Um, getting a mortgage is painful and frustrating. We all know it. Um, over the years, incumbent technology has been a very big blocker for that reason. And over the next few years, 50 to 75 percent of banks are going to replatform. They're the results of huge underwriting inefficiencies that lead to poor, customers ex uh, poor customer uh, experiences and poor broker experiences. We're fixing that by building cloud-native mortgage loan origination to help lenders underwrite faster, react faster to market conditions, build products faster while leveraging open finance data within the origination process. So far, since inception, we went live in January 22. We've processed over 130 million pounds of mortgage application resulting in 28% of underwriting inefficiency gain to our clients. As a result, we're the first startup to win material supplier contracts in the space, and we're onboarding three lenders for 2024, about to originate over 350 million pounds of mortgages annually. These deals, these multi-year deals are, are worth 3.8 million contract value, and our pipeline is worth around 15 million pound. A third of it very highly likely to convert over the next year. We've achieved all this with a very small team of eight and a total of 1.4 million raised. Uh, we have extensive experience in banking, commercial, product, and engineering. And we would love, our vision basically would be to um, make any form of loan origination faster, smoother, and more configurable. And we're looking to connect to investors focusing mainly on the enterprise software sector as we gear up to a Series A in the next few months. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, I'm Vijay, founder of Unravel, the shop attainment for all your wanderlust. So why now? Um, uh, the pandemic has accelerated a change which, has, which was long time coming. We are all spending 200 minutes uh, watching videos on TikTok and Instagram daily. So not surprisingly then that most of our discovery is happening on TikTok. But just discovery is not enough. Uh, the real wanderlust kicks in when you can actually visualize yourself in the destination, and also you get ideas for your next vacation, or next social post, rather. So uh, the legacy platforms are not built for this video-first uh, era. Uh, they are boring, impersonal, and worst of all, they expect you to do all your research elsewhere. So we had to step in. So we built uh, Unravel, a shoppable video feed of world's most Instagrammable experiences. We built this for a generation which is hooked to videos. They are brought up on uh, in infinite scroll of viral videos. So is anyone using it? Yeah, 200 million of them. So we pivoted uh, six months ago 
uh, to solve our distribution uh, problem. We partnered with four of the biggest uh, brands that are there in the region of our focus. We acquired them at zero cost, and we have given all of these brands 4x time spent on the app, 2.5x conversion as compared to the industry average, and 3x average order value as compared to the industry leader. So yeah, uh, hop on. Uh, we are, we, with all of these metrics, uh, we are uh, well poised to disrupt travel, uh, and the, an industry which hasn't seen any innovation in the last two decades, and it's ripe for innovation. So you know where to find me. Thank you. Hello. I'm Julian Schönwig, CEO and co-founder of Diesta. And if you like niche fintech plays with a huge opportunity, you'll love this. Um, 1.6 trillion US dollars flow every single year through the insurance industry. To move that money through the different stakeholders, the different entities spend 32 billion every single year on operational expenses. That's 2% and does not include any bank charges or FX charges. The reason why it is so high is because of over and over and overly repeated manual processes. The insurance industry operates on a very unique tax, tax spec and uses a network of fragmented brokers to distribute their insurance policies. So for example, a third of all UK commercial policies, the payments go through three different broker accounts before they reach the insurer. Now, the solution to all of this is recognizing that all of these processes, uh, processes can be broken down to the same fundamental principle and node to node comparis comparison repeated over and over and over again, opening up a molecule looking structure. With Diesta, we built a next generation reconciliation engine specifically for the insurance industry. Built on that node to node um, comparison principle, we automate and centralize those processes for the insurance industry. We just closed a seed round with 1.9 million with international involvement from five different VCs and have five clients now live, including our first international insurer. So as I said, if you like niche, boring FinTech with a huge potential, you'll love Diesta. Thank you very much. So last but not least, cleaning products. Uh, I'm Matt from Home Things, a retail and e-commerce brand changing the way that we clean. Why? Because the current system is bonkers. Cleaning products are up to 95% water packaged in single-use plastic, which means that 800,000 million gallons of water, that's eight with 11 zeros, I think, is shipped around the world unnecessarily every single year. We're here to make sense of that. We make waterless concentrate products that can be refilled again and again using tap water at home. We launched with cleaning sprays and now we have a full range, including the UK's first powder to gel washing up liquid, which we formulated in partnership with Innovate UK. 2023 has been a good year. Uh, we've closed a round, which has given us great runway. Uh, we're now in 300 retail stores around the country, including 200 Waitroses. And we've really unlocked a great D2C growth, uh, reducing our customer acquisition costs by 40% and increasing AOV by 45%. In 2024, we're gonna be targeting 1,000 stores, which we're hopeful to get in Q2, Q3, and also really scale D2C too. As we hit those targets, we'll be looking to raise, so if anyone wants to chat cleaning and also sustainability investments, it'd be great to chat afterwards. Thanks very much. One more time, can we give a hand for all 20 companies that you just saw? So look, it's been great seeing everyone. I hope you found this session useful, interesting, enlightening. There's a lot of pressing problems in the world. Personally, I find it inspiring that we have so many bright, driven people who are out there trying to solve it. And I hope it came across the authentic stories they have and how they're genuinely the right team to solve these problems. I talked a lot about the themes, right? Founders from different backgrounds. You saw different industry backgrounds where they came from, the diversity of the founders that we're seeing, the problems that they're going after, applied AI, niche segments, right? 
building disruptive business that are solving problems that frankly in many cases are decades old. It's an exciting time to build a company. So thanks again everyone for coming. We've enjoyed your company here. Um, just want to give a quick hand to Sarah for helping out with managing all this. <laughs> um, Ed Knight, who was our president, who spoke at the beginning. Thank you, Ed, for joining. A hand for our panelists, our VC panelists. Thank you so much. Um, and the rest of the portfolio team, Mia and Zena, as well on the Antler team. A hand for them, too. Thank you. So look, we hope to be engaged. For those of you this is your first time, welcome. Nice to meet you. Um, we'll be sticking around afterwards. For those of you who have been with us for a long time, four years or longer, it's great to have you on board. We're excited to keep working with you. Um, snacks and drinks continue. Um, I believe we also have the outside terrace. So please uh, stick around and hope to see you soon. Thanks. <laughs>